But if they suddenly ghost you in week nine, then it doesn't mean they would have been great in week 16. Yeah. What they showed you is they had eight good weeks in them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I look back at what you're saying in my relationship, I'm trying to reflect it. In my teens, I realized I had a serious issue with, I just loved being loved. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind, I, I, I identify with so much of what you said. I was always kind, I was always a gentleman. I was always like generous. But I realized that in my teens, I would go above and beyond to want someone to fall in love with me. And that's all I wanted. All I actually wanted was for someone to fall in love with me. And it didn't actually matter who it was sometimes. Like it wasn't even that I really liked them or knew them or understood them. I just wanted that feeling of this person loves me. And what would often happen is they would fall in love with me because I'd be the perfect guy by giving them gifts and remembering this and whatever it was. And, and then I would feel like they're not giving me anything back. Now I feel like the one I'm the one who's doing all the loving and there's no love back, which I've only created myself because of my crazy cycle. Totally relate to all of that. And I was that guy too. And th those guys will often look at guys who are kind of the textbook, the textbook jerk. Yeah. And be like, well, he's awful. Yes. Like, yeah. you know, he slept with her and he completely ghosted her and he never called her again or he disrespect, whatever. He's, you, it's easy to point to that guy yeah. and be like, what a piece of crap that guy is. But <laughs> we're more dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would then break up with them because I didn't feel loved. And then I'd feel like I was the victim and that I'd been the one not treated well. And then my wife broke me because I tried to, I, I, I did the same thing with her. I was always like, but she wasn't impressed by any of the ways I tried to love her right. apart from being me. And that was when it all kind of like uh. unraveled. And I was like, oh, I finally found someone who actually didn't want all the stuff I was trying to do to get her to love me. Mm. And so my wife was the kind of person who broke through that barrier because she just didn't care about the stuff or the memory or the gifting or the extravagant, like she hated all that stuff. And so all of a sudden my technique wasn't, not tech, it wasn't even a technique, it was genuine in my delusion, but it wasn't working anymore. Right. And that's when I had to really look at it because I really loved my wife and I was like, oh, I actually have to really look at this. And so she was the one who broke that and taught me that idea. That's beautiful. Yeah, so it took someone who valued something completely different totally. than the thing that the weapon you were used to totally. using right exactly the move the yeah. move that she i was like used took to... away all of your special moves yeah all the power so was gone you I have to fight this fight now with none of these special <laughs> moves yeah and then you're all of a sudden like you say it's like being stripped bare yeah now i get a chance to truly be loved for for who i am yeah not the the performance that I'm doing in the beginning, which yeah. as you say, it's not that it's not, it's not genuine. That it was, yeah, it wasn't like I was manipulated. It wasn't manipulative. But it's, it's genuinely about getting something for ourselves. Completely. As opposed to genuinely about discovering somebody else or building something or whatever. And and, and I did the same thing. And it's, it's one of the great, you know, I deal with, my God, in my company, I, we're dealing with I mean, millions of women a month worldwide, but tens of thousands in terms of real coaching. And th the one of the biggest problems is people falling for people really quickly. Yes. Falling in love too fast, where it's because they went on a couple of great dates with a guy and they can look at the date and go, he was amazing and you, you should have seen what he did and how he was on the date and all of that. And the thing I have to always break down is that may not have been about you. Mm -hmm. It is about something he wanted you to feel mm -hmm. by the end of the date. Mm -hmm. And not that, you know, you, I, I, I'm a, I kind of loathe this culture we have right now where everyone's a narcissist. Yes, <laughs> like yes, yes, we yes. Call, we're so quick to like label. Yeah. He's a narcissist, <laughs> she's a narcissist. It, like, I'm like, not everyone, like we all have a narcissistic streak. Absolutely. And we all exhibit narcissistic behaviors at time. That doesn't mean we're a diagnosable narcissist. Completely. But a narcissistic streak we all have early in dating and to differing degrees is the desire to impress yes rather than connect mm -hmm. and so we go on a date with someone and you know at the height of it if someone's really on the extreme end 
they will give the greatest date of someone's life. Yeah. And that person goes away and they're like, this guy is amazing or this person. And they they may have put on an amazing date, but you you know nothing yet. Mm-hmm. And what's cool about your wife say, you know, going, going through that process with you is, you know, I can imagine for her, it's almost like, well, I want to see how you are in week four. Yeah. Or I want to see how you are in month three. Yeah. Or, and until you've been there, you really don't know how great of a partner somebody is going to be. Yeah. And that that's what I mean by, you know, when you ask me about what I've really learned about love and, and I talked about valuing the wrong things, that's mm-hmm. one of the big ways that it shows up. Mm-hmm. If you are getting crazy nervous on a date, mm-hmm. you're already... that's already a reflection of the fact that you valued the wrong things because you're valuing this person's looks or their status or what you perceive them to be but you can't you're not valuing them in a relationship Mm. or in relation to you which is defined by how much they give how they connect with you how they relate to you how they see you all of that stuff is completely is you're a zero yeah So how can you be nervous if you're valuing the right things? You can only be nervous if you're valuing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. If that to me is the key to eliminating early nerves in early dating is that there is, I I almost feel a little fatalistic about it, which is funny coming from someone who gives advice in this area for a living because, you know, I, I do believe that we can influence situations with what we do, but we do have to have a bit of a dose of fatalism that the thing that didn't pan out wasn't the thing. Mm -hmm. The person who's still great in week eight is showing you the right things. But if they suddenly ghost you in week nine, then it doesn't mean they would have been great in week 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, but they were the one and I just, I don't know what, I need closure. You have closure. Mm Mm-hmm. That action was closure. What they showed you is they had eight good weeks in them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It's it's and it's the same as you'd say in sport. Like if you if you I'm just I was just thinking about sport while you were saying that. It's the idea of like a player may have one good season in him or her. Mm-hmm. And then that player may have had ten good seasons in him or her. And sometimes we have these players where we're like oh, she's going to be the next or he's going to be the next. And then all of a sudden, they don't give you that season. And in sports, we get closure by just going, all right, they had potential, but they didn't make it. But you're right, in love and life, it's a lot hard to have that mentality of like, they gave me eight good weeks, but they didn't make it. Well, you and you sit there and you obsess over someone who just left you going, you obsess over what they could have been. Yeah. Right. That's what they it is. could have, th- you know, this was so promising. They were everything that I was looking for. This could have been. And anytime you, you, someone breaks up with us, you know, the heartbreak is the loss of the life we thought we were going to have mm. with someone. This is, this is what it could have been. This is what it should have been. Yeah. And my answer to that is, it would have been mm-hmm. if it should have been and could have been. Yeah then it would have been. You're literally, uh, you're grieving over something that was not, by definition, it wasn't meant to happen because it didn't happen. Yes, yeah, yeah. It didn't happen. So this idea that it it was supposed to or it should have is is myth, it's a fantasy, it's, it's science fiction. Yeah, but I feel like in relationships, we have this fantasy mind that's already written the script and the book and the trilogy before the second date is over. And so it's almost like relationship seems to be like the one area of our life where we write decades into the future and we can't help ourselves because we almost think that that, and and it's almost like you're living, what you're saying is you're living off the fantasy, not even of the reality that's right in front of you. And so even when you're on a date with them, you're not even there because you're in your fantasy land. And of what you think it is. And that's where in in so many ways, everything that you are, you know, your expertise and mindfulness and everything you've learned there is so important in dating. Because in dating, you have to be on the date you're on. Mm-hmm. Mindful dating is be on the date you're on. Don't be on date two 
but really you're not. You're on date 32. <laughs> yeah. there, your mind has to be on date two with your body. Yes. And when people don't do that, that's where they start, they start constructing a fantasy of where this relationship is going. A fantasy of who this person is. They know 5% of someone and they've built the other 95% out of, out yeah. of uh, uh, extrapolation. Yeah. Oh, he was really sweet in that moment. You know, I bet he's good with kids. I bet he's this, <laughs> I bet he's that, I bet he's, you know, yeah. I bet he's an amazing family man. I bet, you know, and, and, and we've all had the experience of meeting someone who is incredibly charming, fun to be around. You know, it, you went away from, like, as men, we sometimes go out and we meet another man and it's like we've been a date on a date with that <laughs> yeah, man yeah. and you come home and you go, he was so great. Yeah, you know, yeah, I was like, yeah. I loved him to bits. He was, a, and he really charmed you. And then six months later, the, the that person has really lost their shine because yeah. they're flaky. You realize they don't actually show up when, when you need them to. Yeah. You realize that it's, they, they kind of, you know, it's that the, in the talented Mr. Ripley, there's that great line. Oh, that's a great movie. Great yeah. movie. There's yeah. a great line where Matt Damon is like, you know, he's become the new chosen best friend yeah. of, of um, Jude Law's Jude character. Law, yeah. And his name, Jude Law's character's name's Dickie. And Matt, Matt Damon is, is feeling suddenly shut out. Like out of nowhere, he feels shut out. When five minutes ago, he was like, this guy's my best friend and he loves me. And he's so, and he says to Matt Damon's girlfriend at the time, he, he's expressing how he feels that it, you know, or no, he's not even expressing. She sees the look on his face that he's sad, that he no longer has this like friendship that feels real to him. And she says, the thing about Dicky is when, when he puts his attention on you, it's like the sun is shining on you. Mm. And then the attention moves on and it's very cold. Yeah. And, and that's the experience of a lot of those people. But when you're taking the 5% of the sun shining on you and you use it to build the 95% that you cannot possibly know, you can't know who this person is when your brother gets sick and you need to travel to the hospital to be with that person and you need support in that moment. You can't know how that person is when you're having an anxious moment and you need someone to show love and compassion towards you and this anxiety that you can't seem to control and what you really need is a loving teammate to be there with you and not to judge you. You can't know mm -hmm. what this person is like in year three of a relationship when the you know, you need to make a shift in your sex life because it feels like that part has become stayed, but you need to work together to figure it out. You don't know what that person is like in those stages. So, in, so thinking that you have all the answers because you've been on even 10 or 15 dates with this person and had a wonderful time is a, is a fallacy, a fantasy. Here are three signs you're struggling with a lack of purpose. Number one, you feel pressure to know what you want to do with your life. Number two, you've lost interest in your own life and feel disconnected. Number three, you don't know what your skills are or you feel you lack them. Hope is not lost. You can get through this. Having purpose and meaning in our lives helps guide us through the ups and downs and creates structure in our day-to-day -day life. That's why I've partnered with Calm, the leading app for mental health and wellness. The app has a library with thousands of meditations, songs to help you relax and focus, and sleep stories to help you get a good night's rest. And now you can find The Daily J, a daily series where I'm sharing proven tools and techniques to improve your mindset and mental health in a matter of minutes.